Welcome to another fantastical, stupendistical, amazingness episode of the One Year No Beer podcast. I am your nuclear power station of energy, Rory Fairbairns. Today, I'm especially excited. I know I'm always excited, but today I'm especially excited because this was a book which had a very big impact on me and certainly helped us guide some of the programs that we run, especially Complete Control. Um, This book was really insightful in its science, its backing, its understanding and helping understand dopamine. And that's why I wanted to invite the author on today. So today's podcast, grab a piece of paper, grab a pen, if you can, preferably not while you're driving. Um, or maybe even the being in working at the gym, which of course both you do. Um, but today I am joined by Dr. Anna Lemke. Anna Lemke is a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine and chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. She's a clinician scholar. She has published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers, book chapters and commentaries. She sits on the board of several state and national addiction-focused organizations, has testified before various committees in the United States House of Representatives and Senate, keeps an active speaking calendar, and maintains a thriving clinical practice. In Dopamine Nation, Dr. Anna Lemke, psychiatrist and author, explores the exciting new scientific discoveries that explain why the relentless pursuit of pleasure leads to pain. Most importantly, she tells readers how to find the delicate balance between the two, condensing complex neuroscience into easy to understand metaphors. Dr. Anna Lemke illustrates how finding contentment and connectedness means keeping dopamine in check. The lived experiences of our patients are the gripping fabric of our narrative. Their riveting stories of suffering and redemption give us all hope for managing our consumption and transforming our lives. And some of the stories are, wow, really shocking. And sometimes when they're shocking, you're like, oh, well, that's not me. But in this book, you're going to get so much actionable learning that you can then implement into your life. So hopefully you'll get some of that from the podcast today. I'm really excited about this episode and because this is a fantastic book. So without further ado, let's welcome onto the show Dr. Anna Lemke. Welcome to the show, Dr. Lemke. Thank you so much for for coming on. Honestly, I'm super excited, a little bit in awe. You know, you have had a huge impact on on my life, your 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 work has, but also you've had a huge impact on on others through the work that we do because we've integrated lots of your thinking and and things like that into our programs. So, I'm so excited to have you here. Very grateful to have you here and for and for the work that you do. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That's lovely of you. And I'm really honored. And thank you, too, for the work that you do, helping people to uh, manage their alcohol consumption. That's great. Yeah, totally. It's a great it's a great thing to do. Um, so, yeah, let's start on that. Um, uh, let's start right there. Why did you get into addiction? Ah, this is a very good question. Um, like so many things in my life, I got into addiction first by running away from it. So my father, <laughs> my father was a surgeon and a very high functioning binge drinker. Um, his brother actually died of alcoholism. So I had, you know, personal familiarity with problem drinking. Um, and I was really quite determined not to, um, go there. That was also aided and abetted by the fact that in medical school, um, at Stanford, um, but this is true for most medical schools in the United States, as well as in my psychiatry residency, I didn't really learn very much about addiction or about how to help people with um, compulsive overconsumption of intoxicants. So it was really more through realizing early on in my career that, wow, a lot of these people I'm trying to help with their depression, with their anxiety, with their insomnia, with you know any manner of psychological problems psychiatric problems, in some cases severe problems, um, they were using substances. And by my not dealing with it, I was actually harming them. So that that was a sort of a huge about face at one point about about 25 years ago when I realized, well, I better, I better you know, learn something about addiction. And then when I did, of course, um, I discovered that patients were eager to talk about it, uh, that many of them were in long-term recovery and wanted to tell me about that. 
Others of them were still struggling um, with various addictions and problematic consumption. And that when we targeted that problem, we, we really got a lot further with their other problems as well. Yeah, absolutely. So the was there, when did you start to dissect the fact that, yes, okay, this is a part of it. It's a symptom, but it's also the driver. You talk about this in the book, Dopamine Nation, with um, one of the ladies who come to see you and she she's using cannabis a lot. And you, you talk very nicely about how, hey, you know, I know you think it's you're coming in here for anxiety, but the truth is, I reckon this thing is causing the anxiety. So if you wind back, when did you unravel that, that it was actually a causing factor of, of these things that people were coming in for? Yeah, such a great question, because the truth is that I 100% learned this from my patients with severe addiction who got into recovery. So those are patients who the goal was very clearly for them uh, that they needed to you know, uh, stop drinking or stop smoking cannabis or stop using cocaine or opioids or whatever it was. And so I worked on that with them. And to both of our surprise, when we did that, their mood was better. Their sleep was better. Their ability to pay attention and be present for their lives was better. Their thinking was clearer. They were less paranoid. There were just so many positive downstream effects from just stopping drinking for four weeks. Because on average, you know, for most comers, that's about what it took. It's not like, yay, my addiction is cured after four weeks of absence. It wasn't like that at all. But it was like, wow, after four weeks of absence, this person is like a completely different person and they feel completely different. So I took that like little bit of experiential knowledge, having witnessed it over and over again in my patients. And I thought, geez, you know, these people who are coming in for depression and anxiety and insomnia, instead of my prescribing them a pill or prescribing psychotherapy, what if we just had them also abstain from their drug of choice for four weeks? Like what, you know, what would happen? And so I I tried that experiment again and again and again. And of course, as you know, that's really well supported by the neuroscience of how we process pleasure and pain. And what I found is that in 80% of patients, just abstaining from their drug of choice, whether it was alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, pornography, video games, social media, shopping, cryptocurrency, you name it, just by getting those high dopamine hits out of their lives, they had huge improvements in mood, in overall levels of anxiety, in their ability to sleep, in their ability to be motivated. And it was just, it was just remarkable. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Um, Okay. So there was there's this discovery, but also um, we could jump into so many areas there. But but you you started to list off some things, and I think this comes down to um, a list of things that people were showing a compulsive behavior to. And this is a thing that we have to uh, be careful of, because what I find is that when you use the addiction word to the layman, um, um, they they switch off. They say, "Oh, okay, you know, addiction to me is the person who sat on the floor, you know, homeless and drinking and blah blah." blah. So that that is like the preconceived idea. So they switch off and they say, well, that's not me. And so we use the word compulsive behavior um, mm-hmm. to to say, hey, this is all of us. And in your book, it's so good that you, you're you really driving that home. But if we're talking about compulsive behavior, and you're saying that these compulsive behaviors are often causing these mental health things that people are coming into you for, and you've now started to list them out, this is potentially a huge proportion of the issues that we have in society is the compulsive behavior rather than the poor mental health that we're seeing. Is that what you are saying? Yeah, absolutely. I'll never forget, and this is going to sound tangential, but it's really not. I'll I'll, I'll link it back. When years and years ago, um, with my family traveling through China, we went to a zoo where they had some captive bears, so bears in captivity. It was actually horrific. Um, And almost all of these bears, as we were driving through on this bus, had some sort of repetitive, compulsive behavior that they did. Um, You know, whether it was like compulsive, you know, pacing or nodding or scratching their, yeah, right. It was just, it was just horrible. But I, that, that image comes back to me again and again when I think about modern humans, because we are living in a time 
and place when we have so much access to highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors in so many different forms that we're essentially constantly stimulating our reward pathways in a way that our brains were not evolved for. And the result is that we have essentially, that, that the modern world has become a kind of cage that we have created, right, in which we're all pressing that lever for more of whatever it is. And I'm, I, I can't help but, you know, think of it as, as similar to those, you know, poor captive bears. It's like we've reached this pinnacle, yeah, you know, this pinnacle of, of sort of uh, abundance, what, you know, what I sometimes call the plenty paradox. And yet, because of the mismatch between our ancient wiring and this modern ecosystem, we are more miserable than ever. So I really think that this compulsive overconsumption problem is a problem that everybody is facing. I mean, only, all you have to do is just go outside and look around at people on their phones and the compulsive co-opting of the reward system through these devices. And, and you know, we're all, we're all vulnerable to it. One of the things I do in my book, as you know, is that I start out talking about a patient of mine who developed a very serious a compulsive sexual behavior um, to the point where he, machine. yeah, right. He made, he made uh, his own masturbation machine. He was a scientist, so he knew how to do that. Um, and I call the chapter, the opening chapter, Our Masturbation Machines, because what I try to do is draw a parallel between what he did, which seems outrageous on the face of it, but truly is not that different from what all of us are doing with our digital devices, which is meeting our needs with a device, our psychological needs, our sexual needs, our intellectual needs, uh, you know, our emotional needs. And, and I try to draw a parallel between that patient and my own compulsive reading of romance novels which, you know, began quite in innocently with the Twilight Saga, but then escalated over the course of about two years, aided by my Kindle, uh, into, uh, a, you know, a mild addiction to um, compulsive reading of erotica. So my point here is that, yes, I, I appreciate that this word addiction elicits a kind of a fear and a sense of otherness, and that's not me, but we are living in the age of addiction and we are all vulnerable. And so I think owning that and, and, you know, being honest about it. And then, as I say, I look to people in recovery from severe addictions as modern day prophets, because those people have had to figure it out as a matter of life and death, right? They were going to die if they didn't figure out their uh, consumption problems. And so there's a whole lot of wisdom in the recovery movement that the rest of us can benefit from, especially living in this dopamine overloaded world. Completely. Yes. Uh, fantastic stuff there. Thank you. And let's just go into that addiction bit. So um, describe, because we what we want to do is make sure that everybody is switched on to this conversation because we're talking about everyone. And right. in order to do that, let's talk about what the feeling is, right, of a compulsive behavior. And mm -hmm. then we can dive into what is happening in the brain from that feeling. Because if I think about the compulsive behavior. So where addiction shows up in my life, I mean, I'm an absolute work addict, right? Yeah. So if I think about that, what do I get out of it? Well, um, I run a social media business. So I get a dopamine hit every time I look at a like or a things or a notification or a thing like that. Right? I have to be very, very careful of that. You're not right. in social media because you, <laughs> you, you talk your way. So because I wouldn't be able to handle it. Trust me. I, I, I would be right there with you. I would be, yeah, it would be ugly. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't. I, I, yeah, it's it's very it's oh, shanty. So <laughs> let's talk about the feeling. What is the feeling of a compulsive behavior that everybody is feeling about something? Yeah. So I I think you know the best way to capture this is to define compulsion, and compulsion has to do with a whole lot of our mental real estate occupied by thinking about using the drug, getting the drug, when we're using it, already contemplating the come down from it and how we're going to be using it again. So it's a real narrowing of our mental focus on this one behavior to the point where if we don't have access or if we go a longer period of time without using, it generates anxiety. And anxiety can manifest in a lot of different ways. It can just be actual feeling anxious, but it can also just be 
intense craving or mental preoccupation or a lot of uh, storytelling, which the brain naturally and instantly does about why it's so important that I immediately get back online or get a drink or use cannabis or, you know, have an orgasm or, or what, whatever it is. So I think it's, it's this pull, right? It's a pull, such a strong pull. I have a colleague who talks about it being like a black hole, you know, and if you get within a certain distance from that black hole, like you're sucked in. Right. You're like, whoop. Yeah. Right. So part of the challenge is pulling away from that black hole and getting enough that you can sort of orbit it and like take a look at it, but not get so close that yeah, that you're gonna get sucked in. So it's that it's that kind of it's the way it dominates our thoughts, our feelings, it's the way that it becomes the reward to the exclusion of other things we value. Um, and I think some soft signs are too our tendency to lie then, not just to ourselves, but other people about what we're doing, how mm. much and how often. That's a very good soft sign of getting pulled into that vortex if we find that we're starting to, you know, I pretend well. that, yeah, hiding the double life. You know, the double life, it's so, I mean, I just had a, a dear colleague who passed away from alcoholic liver cirrhosis and everybody was shocked, completely shocked because she was somebody who when you went out, um, if people were drinking, she wasn't drinking. You know, you would have thought she was a teetotaler, but unfortunately she was a she was a closet drinker, right? So she drank at home when she was alone. So, I mean, the tragic, right? The, the kind of disparity between these two lives she was leading. Some th So lie about it, lying about it, having a double life, so so it being something separate from your reality or your hidden no. away thing. Mm -hmm. Um and and it's I mean mental preoccupation, the, you know that mental, mental preoccupation, preoccupation really key. thinking about it a lot, lot of lot of space in your mind, looking forward to it, feeling like it's the only thing you enjoy, nothing else is as pleasurable. Uh, what's interesting, my daughter, well, so anything that, can go in there. Yeah, it can. I mean, people like really, you can get read, you know, addicted to reading. I mean, I I did, I genuinely did. I was at a point where if we went to a social event, I would bring a book and hide away in a room and read during the social event. That's pretty weird. Um, you know, at some point, <laughs> it's a sort of, you know, when I was hitting bottom, I actually w was reading at work in the ten minutes between pages. I just wanted to escape. You know, I just wanted to escape. And my daughter is the other key word. Yes, escape, right? Non-being, wanting to experience, not just get out of yourself, right? Forget yeah, yourself. Exactly. And my daughter, get who's an avid reader, yeah, my daughter, who's an avid reader and like reads herself to sleep at, at night, you know, which is what I did for my whole life. Um, she is going to be starting at West Point Military Academy, and for Beast, that's the boot camp. They don't let you bring any reading material except for a holy book, and she's like got this look of panic in her eyes. What am I going to do? Like, I'm not going to be able to read. I mean, terror, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, good luck to her. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So, um, is, are there, so are there people more pretend, propensity to this compulsive behavior? And leading into that, there is some great stuff you talk about, about impulsivity and impulse control and uh, other factors around that. that. Yeah. So, you know, we, we used to talk about the addictive personality. That That's not really a term that we use anymore. Instead, we talk about a person's like vulnerability to addiction. And really, we're talking in many ways about their genetic vulnerability, because there's lots of data now, um, you know, suggesting that addiction or the, the vulnerability to addiction, about 50 to 60 percent of that vulnerability is inherited, meaning that it's in your genes, right? You're born with it. Um, that's based on family studies showing that if you have a biological parent or grandparent with specifically alcohol addiction, you are at increased risk to develop an alcohol addiction yourself, even if raised outside of that alcohol using home. So these are pretty convincing studies at this point that there's some, you know, innate vulnerability. It probably has to do with a combination of a tendency toward emotion dysregulation as well as impulse control problems. So one enduring trait is impulsivity that's been highly linked to the risk of addiction. Impulsivity means having difficulty pressing the pause button between the desire or thought to do something and actually doing it. So, and this is a very stable personality trait that it doesn't change across people's lifetimes. I mean, they can work on it, but the trait is still the same. So we do know that people who are impulsive um, or have a tendency toward impulsivity are at higher risk for developing addiction 
Also, people with co-occurring psychiatric disorders are at higher risk. So, for example, people with ADHD, which we believe is a uh, frontal lobe syndrome where people have more difficulty um, appreciating future consequences, which is probably tied into the impulsivity thing, right? Like if you really, you know, were able to see like, oh, if I do this now, that will lead to these people being really unhappy with me. Like if you could see that, you probably wouldn't do it. But if I'm you didn't more see of... that, let's find out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is good. It's like my son who early, early on, we realized, wow, if we tell him to go right, he's going to go left. It was just because we said go right, he, he went left. Yeah. And that's just his personality when you say that's no right. or don't go. Right. Yeah. And again, so if I, I could say in my separate from the research data, in my clinical research or my clinical experience, the two traits that I really see consistently with addict people who get severely addicted are um, this sort of anti-authoritarian piece, people who don't like to be told what to do. And I'm not exactly sure why that links up, but I see that so often. I have that myself, honestly. Um, and then the other piece of it is uh, avoidant coping. So people who really want other people to like them, they don't want people to be at odds with each other, they want everybody to be happy and entertained. And so they will go to great lengths to avoid conflict, and then they'll take care of themselves later by drinking or using or doing. So it's like they're caring for others, avoiding conflict, not wanting to look at, like, you know, the train coming down the tracks, but then self-soothing after that uh, with with substances and addictive behaviors. Really interesting. Um, some of that would probably pay, play into personality type. Uh, right. Although I don't know if you've done any personality type mapping to uh, propensity for addiction. Has there been any work in, in personality type? Oh, yeah, there there has. And again, the sort of the impulsivity is part of it. Also novelty seeking. Um, I don't know if the avoidant personality type has been linked. Cer certainly there's a lot of data showing a link between people who have a co-occurring mental illness and risk for addiction, especially things like bipolar disorder, ADHD, you know, schizophrenia. Um Believe it or not, some forms of anxiety are actually protective against alcohol use disorder. Uh, some forms of OCD might be protective. It's almost like a wanting to, you know, keep that control, um, w which is key it's to a certain, yeah, that, right. So certain that types, one. that's right. Yeah. So certain anxious types, are, are their anxiety is kind of protective. Interestingly, too, um, you know, we use the SSRIs like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa. To, to treat anxiety. And I have had at least two cases in my career where people came in with, these were very high functioning professionals, both of them men, um, who had terrible anxiety, treated them with an SSRI, like Prozac or Paxil or Zoloft or something, had tremendous um, benefit from that, and then became alcoholics. Wow. It's not funny. But there's, and you just, what's the mechanism? There's something with the appetitive control, especially around carbohydrates that can actually increase alcohol cravings. Or it could be also that their anxiety was sort of, again, protecting them against a more reckless behaviors. Um, Interesting. And when you took that away, then they that's right. opened up the floodgate for being out. That's right. That's right. Which speaks to, you know, the, the way in which anxiety is necessary, right? A certain amount of anxiety is advantageous for humans. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting stuff. Um, and um, one thing I was thinking about there. Oh, just linking back into the impulse control. You know, in our in our complete control program, um, we were surveying into personality type and looking at personality oh, type great. as a key factor of helping yeah. people understand their behavior. Um, but also the impulse control. We use the Barrett impulsivity score, um, the Barrett impulsivity scale, which is a highly complex piece of instrument used mostly for scientists, but we have turned it into our own layman's um, oh, good. piece uh, tool now, which is so helpful for people, I think. What we are ultimately see seeing there is that if impulsivity is if Im impulsivity is high for you, then your ability to control drinking is going to be more difficult. And therefore, understanding and trying to regulate your impulsivity must be one of the factors that you try to address going forward. Um, and, you know, we've seen um, some studies now showing that you can help reduce it or change your impulsivity, even train your brain to be less impulsive. Um, so things like that. Anyway. 
Oh, that's that's great. And I, I think that I think that's wonderful. You know, it, this is it's sort of like know thyself, but you know, it's not it's not you're not learning yourself just generically because you're learning yourself for a very specific aim around managing consumption. And I think that's really important um, because it gives people a framework to sort of understand, okay, so this is me and this is how I'm vulnerable in this type of situation and this is what I can do about it. So I think that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about um, the, the the big dopamine word, but to, to lead into that, I think if we go back to what you were saying about you discovering that people were coming in for... for um, um, people were coming in for mental health or issues like that. You were then realizing it was about addiction. We've decided we've described addiction as this compulsive behavior and and being this compulsion into the black hole. So, what point in your career did you realize this thing called dopamine? And maybe mm-hmm. let's talk about what dopamine is and and the discoveries you've made there. Right. So, um, well, first of all, full credit to my basic neuroscience colleagues. You know, I don't do that work. I I am a parasite off of their work, and they're amazing. So, you know, but I I am I am a scientist. I am medically trained, and so when I decided that I needed to figure out uh, how to help patients with addiction, of course, that involved learning about the brain and what was going on there. And um, you know, I have so many wonderful colleagues. Um, who do this work, and they've been so generous with their time, letting me visit their labs and talk to them, and of course, reading the literature. And, um, you know, there have been amazing discoveries in in the neuroscience of addiction in the past 50 to 75 years. And it's a tremendous help, I realized, for both providers, but also patients to understand what is actually happening in their brains. And with that framework, you know, it allows people, just like with the framework of impulsivity that you're, you're you're using, with the framework of the neuroscience, people have more ability to observe themselves in real time and to make choices based on the neuroscientific understanding of what's happening in their brains. Completely. And yet, you know, it's if you read the medical literature on it, it's it's super confusing, the literature. So I thought, you know, people would really benefit from kind of a very... Uh, so it's a simplified metaphor to understand this complex neuroscience so that they can sort of put it in their pocket and take it with them, um, you know, to help them in their own personal lives. So that was that was really the goal. Amazing. So rather than you discovering dopamine, what I meant was in your journey <laughs> of, 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 of realizing of, from a neuroscience perspective that this was what was going on. And you do, you do, you do explain it so clearly and so beautifully so um the 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 other part into you know what is dopamine what is going on inside the brain when it comes to addiction what do we tell tell us about that and then i want to get on to this pleasure pain pool wonderful thing we're going to dive into yeah great 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 okay so so dopamine is a chemical that we make in our brains it's essential for the experience of pleasure reward and motivation it may be even more important for motivation than pleasure itself. So, for example, there's a very famous experiment where rats were engineered to have no dopamine receptors. Receptors are the places where the dopamine, the neurotransmitter, binds, right? So no dopamine receptors means no dopamine transmission, no dopamine effect. And what they found in those rats who had no dopamine in this specific reward circuit was that if you put food in their mouths, they would eat the food and seem to get pleasure from it. But if you put it you know, a body length away, they would starve to death. So in other words, dopamine seemed to be really, really important for the motivation to do the work to get the reward. And in fact, my, yes, right, to survive, right? Yeah. Uh, and my, my, my neuroscience colleague, Rob Malenka, who's done a lot of this work, he says that one of the ways that he measures in the laboratory how addicted an animal is, is by how hard they're willing to work to get the reward. How many times are they willing to press the lever? How many mazes are they willing to explore? And that certainly translates nicely over into humans because that's what you see in severe addiction, people putting all of their resources beyond what you could possibly imagine and beyond rationality, certainly, into getting their drug, using their drug, hiding their drug use. So dopamine is super important. The more dopamine that's released and the faster it's released, the more reinforcing that substance or behavior is. And let me just emphasize, people can get addicted to behaviors. Uh, and, and develop compulsive overconsumption of behaviors just as they can to substances like alcohol and cannabis and cocaine and opioids. Um, 
there's this concept of drug of choice, which I think is really important. And amazingly, there's not very much science about this. But this is this idea that we're all wired a little bit differently. So what may re release a lot of dopamine in my brain, chocolate, romance novels, YouTube videos of cats doing silly things, might not release <laughs> much dopamine. My in, daughter you know, you... loves the funny cats and dogs. I know. I know. <laughs> it seems innocent, but but it's not. Anyway, but 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 by contrast, you know, uh, even though my my father struggled with alcohol, alcohol literally is non reinforcing for me. I I, I don't get it, um, you know, from a subjective experience because it doesn't do anything for me. It, I, I caffeine doesn't wake me up. I I've had more cups of coffee in my life in an attempt to experience, uh, you know, the uh, the stimulant effects. I just don't get that. So we're all wired a little bit differently. And one of the points I make in the book, which I think is really important, is that I thought that whatever this addiction gene is, I didn't get it. But what I, what the truth is that I hadn't yet met my drug of choice. And when mm -hmm. I discovered romance novels through the medium of an electronic reader, such that I could become a chain reader, you know, and I had this infinite access to a novel and bountiful source of my particular drug, I became a compulsive consumer verging on addiction. Um, so that that speaks to why living now is really, really hard. Because if you are one of those people like me who might have been immune to addiction to traditional drugs, well, guess what? There's a whole host of new drugs out there that didn't ex exist before or a medium that delivers these drugs in a way that makes them more addictive such that we're really all vulnerable to this problem. Um, and what's interesting about the finding the drug of choice, I think, is we, we've already demonstrated or talked about how this is the compulsive behavior that we all have it, um, or, or not that we all have it. I think most of us have it at some point or um, however we want to look at it. And you said, you know, not until you found your drug of choice. I think that many people, what they do is they end up getting to a place where they feel like there's an addiction or they want to change something um, from this compulsive behavior. And then they try to abstain from it. And then what happens is they end up swapping it to something else because they still yeah. have this this need or this desire. So um, yeah, do you see that as very, very common? And what are you doing about it? What do you think we need to do about that? Yeah, so absolutely. That's something that we talk with our patients all the time about. You know, one of our main interventions is this dopamine fast where we ask people to abstain for four weeks. Four weeks is the amount of time that people can kind of wrap their heads around. It's also the amount of time that it takes to reset reward pathways. But we warn them about cross addiction. You know, we say, hey, well, you know, you're going to give up cigarettes. What you don't want to do is now increase cannabis use or start drinking more or start using pornography. Um, what you want to do is, unfortunately, the hard thing, which is tolerate the discomfort of withdrawal, which usually lasts about 10 to 14 days, and then you'll start to come out of it and you'll start to feel better. And by four weeks, you may feel better than you have in years um, because that's what we see. But it, it, it's, you know, basically tolerating the pain. The other thing that I advise is something that's called hormesis, and hormesis is Greek for to set in motion. And it's the scientific literature showing that organisms that are exposed to mild to moderate doses of toxic stimuli actually become more resilient and more robust. So what are we talking about for humans? We're talking about things like ice cold water baths, exercise. Exercise, for example, is immediately toxic to cells. So how on earth could that be good for us? Well, what happens when we exercise is that we tell the body there's an injury. And in response, the body starts to upregulate its own feel-good hormones and neurotransmitters like dopamine, like norepinephrine, serotonin, our endogenous opioid system, our endogenous cannabinoid system. So I, I recommend a lot of hormesis. I say to patients, okay, you know, in those 30 days or those four weeks, uh, you know, when you get a craving, instead of grabbing a cookie or watching Netflix, which might actually trigger you to crave more, instead, why don't you get up off the couch and go walk around the block, right? or take an ice cold shower, or, you know, do 20 sit-ups, or read a really difficult text, or meditate, or pray. These are all things that require effortful engagement. They're not immediately reinforcing. In fact, they may, uh, they may be painful. And that's kind of the idea, um, is that you do something that's 
more painful than the pain of withdrawal. So pleasure, pain, balance. This is a fascinating thing when it comes to dopamine. Tell me, what is the pleasure, pain, balance um, and the significance of it perhaps wrapped into somebody trying to change their relationship with alcohol? So in order to understand how we get into compulsive overconsumption or addiction, it's necessary to understand how our brains process pleasure and pain. And one of the most exciting findings in neuroscience in the last 75 years or so is that pain and pleasure are processed in the same part of the brain. They're co-located and they work like opposite sides of a balance. So imagine a beam on a central fulcrum, kind of like a teeter-totter in a kid's playground. When that teeter-totter is at rest, that beam is parallel to the ground. It's tipped neither one way or another. And that beam... It's a seesaw both... for all my European listeners. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a seesaw. Oh, yeah, teeter-totter. Oh, I didn't know that. Interesting. Teeter-totter, seesaw. Yeah, that's the same thing. Okay, so... Uh, and that that seesaw represents how we process pleasure and pain. When, 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 the, when the balance tips one way, we experience pleasure. When it tips the opposite way, we, we experience pain. There are certain rules governing how this seesaw works. And one of the most important rules is that it wants to remain level so that with any deviation from neutrality, our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. Now, the way that we restore homeostasis is first by tilting an equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus is. So let me let me walk us through that. I eat a piece of chocolate. I get a little release of dopamine in my reward pathway my balance tilts slightly uh, to the side of pleasure. No sooner has that happened than my brain adapts to that increased dopamine by downregulating dopamine transmission, not just to baseline, but below baseline. So that's, you can imagine that as these little neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again, but they like it on the balance, so they stay on until it's tilted an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the after effect, or in my case, wanting one more piece of chocolate, even while I'm finishing the first one. Now, if I wait just a few moments, those gremlins hop off and homeostasis is restored. But the key here is that for every pleasure, we pay a price. That price is the opposite of the pleasure. It may be transient and even outside of uh, our, our conscious awareness, but it's there. And for more significant intoxicants, like, for example, an, a night of drinking, we'll have a hangover the next morning, right? And that hangover is part of then... Yeah, that it may be for some people it's a deterrent, but for others it's it may be, you know, a drive to, to use more. So that's the first rule of the balance. The second rule of the balance, which is really key to understanding compulsive overconsumption or addiction, is that with repeated exposure to the same or similar reinforcing stimulus, that initial deviation to pleasure gets weaker and shorter, but that after response to pain gets stronger and longer. In other words, those gremlins start to multiply. They get bigger and bigger. You've got Arnold Schwarzenegger gremlins. And if we continue to use our drug of choice over days to weeks to months to years, we end up with so many gremlins on the pain side of the balance that they fill this whole room. They're camped out there, tents and barbecues in tow. And now we're in what's called a chronic dopamine deficit state. So we've essentially changed our hedonic or joy set point. Now we need our drug not to get high, but just to feel normal. And when we're not using, we're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, which are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and mental preoccupation with using our drug, otherwise known as craving. Mm, Wow. I mean, well, well described. Thank you so much. And in that, so pleasure and pain, how linked is that to happiness and sadness? Or is that what we're talking about? What is the exact link to there? Right. So... Great. You know, here I'm using pain very broadly to encompass not just physical pain, although I do include physical pain, because when we talk about hormesis, what we're talking about is intentionally inflicting physical pain and emotional pain uh, on ourselves, right, as a way to get those gremlins to cross over and go on the pleasure side of the balance to reset our joy set point to the side of pleasure, which is exactly what happens. So, but yes, it's a, it's a good clarification. Pain is an all-encompassing term, as I'm using it now, to include a physical pain, but also emotional pain, tolerating boredom, doing things that make us anxious, doing things that we're afraid to do, doing things that are intellectually challenging, doing things that are creative and require sustained attention, uh, doing things like meditation and prayer, which again, 
uh, force us to be still and to be quiet and to tolerate uncomfortable feelings and to ask for help and all of those things. Yeah. So following that, um, doing, doing hard stuff, doing tough stuff, um, allows you to be happier. Absolutely. And importantly, this is in the context of a world in which we are insulated from pain and constantly being invited to imbibe intoxicants in every possible form. So every aspect of modern life has become drugified, made more accessible, more reinforcing, that is to say releases dopamine, when more dopamine, uh, made more abundant, uh, made more novel. So we're you know, when you think about like Buddha's middle way, right? Buddha, 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 he tried indulging and he said, oh, that's not the way. Then he tried, you know, a severe asceticism and he got really skinny. He was like, oh, that's not the way. It's like, oh, it's the middle way. You know, that's, that's Buddhism essentially. And what I'm advocating for is a little bit to the pain side of the middle way, because we live in a world in which we're so insulated from pain and in which we're so intoxicated by constant pleasures that we actually have to, with intention, seek out doing things that are hard and inconvenient in order to keep our own physiology in balance. So when you think about this pleasure pain system, I think a really reasonable question is why on earth would mother nature do that to us? Make, you know, make every pleasure fleeting, make pleasure be followed by pain. Like that's just a horrible brain system. Why? But in a, in a world of scarcity, and ever-present danger, which is the world that human beings have existed in for almost all of human time up up until about the last 200 years, that's a great system, right? Because it means you're never satisfied with what you have. You always want more. Every pleasure is transient. As soon as it's over, you feel pain, then you want to get more. And, you know, humans were evolved to have to put in a whole lot of work up front for any kind of pleasure at all. And they were constantly being exposed to painful elements in nature. Yeah, right. Like you had to walk, you know, tens of, we were evolved to walk tens of kilometers every day. Now we do not get up off the couch. Right. So are you in a, are you in a pain deficit? Are you in a, well, this is exactly it. It's like, you you know, you look around now and, and people stub their toe and all of a sudden they have, you know, they have post-traumatic stress disorder from that. And it's like, what, what, what happened? And I really contend it's it's not it's not like some kind of moral, you know, uh, moral thing. I think it's actually physiologic that because we are so insulated from from pain and because we're constantly titillating ourselves, we've actually changed our brains. And now we are as individuals and as nations in this chronic dopamine deficit state as a result of our brains trying to compensate for the fire hose of dopamine that we're getting from all of these drugified experiences. And, you know, this is my, my, my clinical practice would corroborate this over the past 20 years, more and more people coming in with anxiety, depression, who have what would on the face of it seem to be wonderful lives, loving parents, great families, robust social networks, access to elite education, access to nature, all of the things that we associate with the good life, and yet they can barely get out of bed in the morning. If you look at epidemiologic studies looking at rates of happiness, they've gone down over the last 20 to 30 years, and they've gone down the most in wealthy nations. If you look at nations around the world and increasing rates of anxiety, depression, suicide, they're going up all over the world, especially in rich nations. So we have this inverse thing between wealth of nations and the level of uh, you know, despair the wealthier the nation, the more unhappy its people. And I think, I think in part it can be explained physiologically. I need to, you know, one of those Shakti mats, you know, the Shakti mat? No. Uh, it's got all the, all the spikes in the back and you lie. Oh yes. Right. Like, sleep on that. So I need one of those, no, <laughs> not sleep on it, but actually put it down. So I wake up in the morning and start walking on my Shakti mat. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Day. So right. I need more donuts. Yeah. Right. No. But I think, do you know Joe DeSena from Spartan? Yes, I do. Have you met yeah. him? Have you? Ch- yes. Have you spoken? Yeah. I mean, not in real life, virtually, virtually. He's a, he's a good friend. He's also an investor in one, you know, beer. Um, oh, great. He's just, I'm going to have to message him because he's just going to love this. He's always <laughs> about, you got to go out and do tough stuff. So he is going to love yeah. that the whole yeah. message very, very much. Um, 
there was something else d leading on to that. So I think that's really fascinating. And specifically, I love, you know, that the, the exercise is there with pain. Because a lot of people like exercise and people get addicted to exercise. But if yeah. it's in the pain bucket, then that is a good thing to get addicted to. Um, well, cold bath. wait, let's put it, let's okay. put a little pin in there because, uh, um, you know, you can get addicted to pain and that that's not good either. So if you press on that pain side of the balance too hard and too fast, you can overdo it and then essentially deplete, um, those feel good neurotransmitters and, and get that balance stuck on the side of pain. Let me give you a couple examples. So exercise addiction is real and I've treated patients who, cannot stop exercising, even though mm, they yeah. have serious injuries, uh, their family never gets to see them and says, you know, please stop exercising. Their, their work is compromised. They're in a compulsive loop. And so that's clearly not good. Uh, cutting, you know, people self-cutting. The reason people cut is because it releases endogenous opioids in response to the injury. And people get addicted to that. And that's not good. Because it, again, it's too much too fast. There's an interesting study of skydivers, people jumping out of airplanes. Initially, the the after response of skydiving is a kind of like a terror. But with the subsequent ones, they get this intense euphoria. after. But then over time, they actually get anhedonia where they're not able to experience joy in anything because they've depleted that, right? The, the, the stimulation is too much and then their brains are exhausted. So hormesis is key. It's got to be in that window, just enough, but not too much. So the advocate of balance. What might be too much for one person isn't isn't enough for another person. So you want to make sure you individualize it. Completely. So very specific to the individual. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> that shot at my brain, that little little thinking. Yeah. Oh, no. Before, because what I want to go to is the how-to next. Um, but so what do we do and how do we find this balance and what do we need to do? And uh, you've got a lovely, um, and the grand wrong word. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Acronym, acronym, right. Acronym. Ac that's, that's it. it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but before we touch on that, I want to just talk about the, the, the really interesting piece, which is what you said in the book is that when the the seeking of so the dopamine is the seeking of um the 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 seeking of rather than the actual getting of the the thing and what you've seen is that when people don't get the thing the spike is much greater in the dopamine release um and so uh, uh, tell me a bit more about that but also how does that come into play if, for example, you are trying to stop drinking um, and you're in the usual surroundings, you're in the usual thing, you're in the, the seeking is all there, but you're not getting the thing. And how does that play into alcohol-free alternatives where you are getting 99% of the, we're a huge advocate of alcohol-free alternatives, right? We, we, we think that, you know, all of the psychology is there, none of the poison. So you're, you're, it's a great replacement out, but it is playing into this thing of, I'm going to get this alcohol. I'm going to get this alcohol. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. But then I don't actually get it. Right. So, so just so you know, go, go back and listen to this section. Cause I think you might've misspoken at one. Cause I think you said when you don't get it, you get a dopamine spike. No, that's okay. Um, because yeah so okay so so the what, what so let's talk about sort of the behaviors around getting the the drug um a lot of my patients will tell me that even in the preparation phase where they know they're going to go and get a drink they're already experiencing a little bit of a high in anticipation like they can feel the dopamine in anticipation and this has been studied in in rodents in rats and mice where um, a rat was trained to know that when it saw a light, if it went over to a lever and pressed that lever, it would get an injection of cocaine. And then the researchers measured dopamine levels through that process. And by the way, we're always firing dopamine at kind of baseline tonic levels. It's sort of like the, the heartbeat of the brain. And what they discovered was that, yes, of course, when the rat got the injection of cocaine, there was a huge increase in dopamine firing. But there was also a mini increase in dopamine firing just when the rat saw the light, which was the reminder or the cue that the cocaine was coming. But even more interesting, right after that little mini dopamine spike on seeing the light, there was a little drop in dopamine below baseline level, so a little mini dopamine deficit state. And that's, of course, craving. 
So what that means is when we get, when we have a cue or reminder or even our own euphoric recall of using our drug of choice, we get a little bit high followed by a little bit of withdrawal, right? And withdrawal is then what drives drives the motivation to go and get that drug. Interesting. Yeah. And so because of that, yeah, because of that, people often ask, well, can I, can I drink near beer? So there are a couple prob- potential problems. And, you know, everybody's different for some people. It's fine. But here's a, a couple of reasons why they might not want to do that. Number one, a lot of near beers or kombuchas are not that well regulated and have quite a bit more alcohol than is on the label. So, you know, that's no good because then you're actually getting your drug. And what we know from animals and humans is that even after long periods of abstinence, if you're exposed to your drug, that will release a little bit of dopamine and send you off in, into this craving state, which will then lead to you not, you know, meeting your goals around alcohol use, whatever they are. But the other thing about uh, near beer is that even if there's no alcohol in it, the the shape of the bottle, the label, the flavor, the smell, all of that might induce a little bit of a dopamine spike in anticipation, followed by a little dopamine deficit state. Yeah. Where then, like, oh gosh, near beer, you know, becomes beer uh, really quickly. Um, so that's something something to keep in mind. The other thing, oh yeah, go ahead. I was going to. I, I want to slightly challenge that perspective. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just please. In here, yeah. Because um, we are not aiming for abstinence in a in 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 a place where it's balanced. We're not aiming for abstinence of what is a prolifically available substance normalized entirely by society. Alcohol, right. 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 So if you want, yes, great. If you decide that you never want to drink again and that's for you and that's the right way to be for you. And also maybe you are somebody that needs to um, um, take that decision. But if you're somebody who wants to get control, as an example, um, then being able to being able to use those things which don't add that massive amount of dopamine right. rush are probably going to be helpful, more helpful than, I guess, having an alcoholic drink or having nothing. I don't know. Thought- I 100% agree. And and, and although I, there, I don't know of any studies actually looking at that with near beer or kombucha, there are other studies advocating for low potency forms of the drug as a way to prevent, uh, you know, against addiction. And this is, for example, in, yeah. what? Sorry, yeah. say that again. Sorry, carry on. I interrupted. You. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, because so, so, so you're absolutely right. You know, especially if the goal is moderation and not abstinence. Part of you know, part of it is not just that do- dopamine is released, but how much and how quickly. So if you have a low potency form of your drug of choice, it's not going to release as much dopamine. It's not going to release it as quickly, and then that is helpful because when we think about that pleasure pain balance. It's not that we want to avoid intoxicants altogether or like we don't want dopamine. Dopamine's great and we need it and we're we're seekers and that's how we're wired, right? But what you want to do is you want to tilt that pleasure pain balance just a little bit to the side of pleasure. You don't want to slam it down really hard. And so you can do that, you know, with a more non-potent formulation. The other thing that's really important is um, that kind of a near beer or, you know, a, a lot was, as you know, very popular now is these fancy non-alcoholic drinks, but they're like exciting and fun and they taste good. And so th- that's a nice replacement, you know, for people who want to have something to look forward to. Also in a social setting, a lot of times people are so worried about what other people will think if they don't drink. Really, nobody else cares unless they're alcoholics and they're trying to get you to be alcoholics with them, which happens. Depends if you're in the UK in a pub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. So, yeah. But, you know, if you have something that looks <laughs> like it. And, okay. Peer, peer pressure is real. Yeah. So if you have something that looks like it and smells like it, um, you know, pretty soon, you know, everyone's it's there. People are going to forget if it's one or the other. And so that that allows you to kind of blend in. And, you know, pretend to be drunk if, if that's kind of what you, what you need to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, good. So, um, and I think that is the thing, just solidifying in on that is, is it's about, in your in your mind, it's about reducing the extremisms of this, of this seesawing part in here. And the, and the extremism is, is what's causing damage. So, um. Yeah, let me, let me jump, let me jump in there. Let me jump in there and just, so, 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 so it's about. F- it's really what it's about is about experimenting and being radically honest with yourself and others about how that experiment goes. Because everybody is a little bit different. I have some, uh, you know, patients who can drink kombucha near beer and who who can moderate and even have an alcoholic beverage 
and they can manage that. And I have more patients that can't, right? But they, it's a matter of experimenting and, and seeing what's, what's, what works for you. And when you think about that balance, the idea is to press on the pleasure side, not too hard, not too fast. And importantly, leave enough time in between for those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop on, hop off, and for the balance to be restored so you don't get into that chronic dopamine deficit state. Totally. So um, before we, I'd love to finish up with going through the dopamine acronym, um, your your um, wonderful acronym about what to do and how to take the steps here. Um, but bef- just before we do that, touch on um, the damage done by this sort of addictive or compulsive behavior. We talked about it, uh, you talk about it in the book um, from the brain perspective. And then also you wonderfully mentioned about how two parts a this is lifelong damage that you do in getting into that compulsive behavior but that also now we're showing some great research uh, and some great science this is showing that we can repair that damage um um principally through some things like honesty uh and, <laughs> yeah and some, some words into there so sorry i've kind of led you up oh you know that's great it lets me know what you want me to cover yeah so, so basically, what it looks like that once once you become seriously addicted to something, you've probably permanently altered your brain. I'm a little bit hesitant to use the word damage, but you you've permanently altered your brain. You've created those Better. addiction circuits, and you can atrophy them, but they never entirely go away. Um, which is why people can relapse even after decades of not using their drug of choice if they're re-exposed to that drug or a similar drug. It can plummet them suddenly, you know, into the depths of their addiction with no ramp up period at all. Why is that? Because they've essentially those, those circuits are still there, uh, and you kindle them, and you know, over you know, in a moment you have a kind of a conflagration, right? But the good news is that people definitely can get into recovery. I mean, recovery is real. Um, you know, people with severe, very severe addictions get into lifelong recovery. And my, my colleague, Edie Sullivan, who studies recovery from alcohol addiction, has shown that probably what's happening is that new circuits are being made in recovery that route around those damaged reason, regions. So that's very encouraging. It means with enough brain plasticity and enough, you know, doing the recovery exercises, um, you can you can develop new neural circuits and you can really um, overcome these problems. And we have millions of people all over the planet who are living in recovery from addiction, and they're remarkable people. They're leading remarkable lives. Um, they've come to it from many different paths. Um, and most of them, frankly, when it comes to alcohol, are abstainers. But more and more, we're hearing stories, and there's some uh, data to show people who abstain for a period and then are able to go back to using in in moderation with a lot of, you know, control barriers in place. It's not something that they can do lightly or necessarily easily. Yeah. I think I think the so the part where we're very focused here um over at One Year No Beer is it, A, we never really were into the severe addiction space. So it's all about right. really lifestyle change. And and yes, we have a lot of very, we've had a lot of very heavy drinkers who would traditionally be labeled as addict or alcoholic or something like that, uh, not labels that we use. Um, but, and and the most important thing is to say that you can, you, you that it is possible. Um, because I think in part, people want to believe that it's possible. I think we've seen, and I've got a great researcher, he's uh, head of um, research, he has was head of research at uh, Public Health England coming on the podcast, um, showing a lot of research around um, controlled drinking, that actually the whole, a lot of the abstinence piece has stopped a lot of people getting help um, because they yeah. don't want to abstain and mm-hmm. and they don't want to, what they want is to get control. But right. so I think, I think that, the 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 developments and the research into this space is really really fascinating it's something that we're driving very hard that we want to 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 help um people achieve we can help people achieve earlier and things like that so um, yeah i yeah. think the discussion of moderation is really key um, because we are again because we're living in this world Just where to... yeah you don't use that word either we don't know we don't use that word either and i think the co- the core part of moderation is that for for most people in the addiction space moderation sounds like it's something that you do every day or weekly and that you're controlling your consumption and that is not my behavior right so i drink i mean on i hardly drink i mostly don't drink i could go and have 10 drinks in one evening i would regret it for a week or two 
um, <laughs> but mostly I don't drink. And I yeah. think that's the right place for people to get to with a yeah. substance like alcohol that's so mm-hmm. toxic. Um, I think the, the, the right space of people is that generally they don't drink. But if they're going to go to a seminar or a work event or there are no awards ceremony or a wedding, mm-hmm. not necessarily labeling as special events, or, but they just might have a drink. And I think that is... Okay, so that's very interesting. So, and language is important. Um, and I've been using this term moderation. And, and even I talk about extreme moderation, which I think fits this model that you're talking about, um, where people generally don't drink. But, you know, now and then they may, um, prompted by the circumstance with some usually uh, quantity limits that they have for themselves as well as in some cases taking taking a medication like naltrexone, which is an opioid receptor blocker that helps them stop earlier um, because it makes the alcohol not quite as reinforcing. So, but but it is interesting. I'm curious though. This emphasis, your, your emphasis. Why why is it advantageous for you and uh, your clientele to not use the word moderation and to I, I guess the, the idea is to be a non-drinker except every once in a while, but not in a planned way. Because I really advocate that that moderation it works best if you have a plan, that you say to yourself, I'm only going to drink in this situation with these people, I'm only going to have this much, that it's the specificity of the plan that goes a long way to um, you know, ensuring the success. But tell that that is not the plan you, is you talk. very important. No, 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 you're right. The plan is extremely <laughs> important and something we help people with. Boundaries, rules, having an understanding. They've got to understand okay. themselves. They've got to yeah. they've got to understand how likely um this is for them to be able to control their drinking, right? So if you are a very severe drinker, you know, alcohol waking up in the day and things like that, it's just forget this conversation. This is not the right, right conversation. Yeah. You you should be thinking about abstinence and abstinence only. Um, until we've got into a different path and worked on some of these things. But but um, so, so first of all, there's the likelihood, the propensity or uh, the possibility for you. And then when it comes down to the thing, I got this wonderful description of, I think it's a bit more like rally driving. Um, and, and so a rally driving, a rear wheel drive rally driver is just sort of slightly, oh, hang on, I had a little bit too much that night. You know what, I'm going to stop drinking for the next month because that is going to help me have better control because I had a little bit more than I expected. But again, the main piece in here for people is that um, this is not... So, so you mentioned the, the the perfect word there, which is about, you know... Um, um, oh, just one second. I need to get it back into my brain. You mentioned about... Um, um, ah, it's, it's shooting out. Um... It'll come back in a minute. Come back, little birdie. Take your time. Take your time. Um, let's say I was talking about people needing a specific plan, that we talk about moderation. We do talk about special occasions, it's how much, how often. Moderation and not moderation. Yeah. And, and, what, and, and what is this? And what, I mean, I think you and I are talking about doing the same thing and talking about the same thing, but there is some interesting difference in language. You got it. Okay. I got it. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. Um, so as an example, you know, if you are talking about extreme or very severe alcoholism, then we probably are not going to be, it's going to be more challenge to get into control. But if you wind back from that a little bit um, and, and you apply it to something else like chocolate, it's not a case of saying to somebody, you can't eat chocolate again, right? Um, it, you, you can't ever eat chocolate again or you cannot ever have sugar again. Well, no, that's not true. Now, we have applied it using old science and things like that to say from alcohol that you must abstain and you're either an alcoholic in moderation. And this is a lot of what we are challenging. Um, and a lot of what the science is showing, you're talking about um, um, you know, your specific work there, like, hey, this is about helping us reduce down this, this need for this high level of dopamine rush. And we can do these things. And you've talked about exercise, cold bus, meditation. This is exactly what we're getting people to do to to help go through that process so that if they go and have an alcohol drink, uh, alcoholic drink or one or two, it's not going to send them down a path of now suddenly I'm having lots and lots of um, alcoholic drinks. And more importantly, they should have 
if they do end up having a drink or two or three or four drinks and it goes off the rails, they need to have a very strong framework in place that brings them back to being alcohol. Right. And right. that is exactly what we we do right. here. Um, literally, in part of it is is producing a little plan in it, which they give to an accountability partner that helps them go back onto the piece. Right. Great. So interesting. So almost, yeah, absolutely. So kind of like using the the sponsorship program that's used in Alcoholics Anonymous, but for an individualized goal. And this is the way. I mean, this is uh, this is also the work that we do. Right. We meet patients where they are. Um, patients' goals change over time. So you can have somebody who comes in and they're like, I, I need to abstain. And then maybe after a while, they say, you know what, I think I want to try to go back to use in moderation. Your patient didn't come and say, um, you know, I want to use in moderation. And repeatedly, they, you know, violate their own goals and norms around drinking. And they get to a point where they say, I'm not, you know what, I think this is too hard for me. It's easier if I just abstain. But we do this all the time. And people go in and out of what their goal is. I think the key here really is accountability, right? Um, and how to be truthful and accountable and really track it honestly and listening to other people because we're not always the best judges of when it starts to go south. Do you know what I mean? Um, oh, I think that, yeah, so, so right, right. So it's like, I'm fine. You know, it's like, well. <laughs> I, heard, I, heard, um, I heard that to Derry, somebody. I mean, it is actually Andrew Huberman. And he was saying, oh, yeah. if you're procrastinating over something, what you need to do is do something even more difficult and it will make the thing you're procrastinating over easier to do. Right. And I'm like, let me just say, he got that from get? my book. He got that from my book. I, I love it. Get get my psychology. Something harder. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Oh, easy for you to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's, he's great. And uh, yeah, he is. He's, he's struggling with, yeah, all the same things the rest of us are struggling with. So. Totally. Exactly. I think that's what makes us great. Uh, well, I don't mean to put myself into any at all the same category, but it's just, <laughs> hey, I'm, 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 I'm learned. These are my foibles. I, I right. I'm a human. I was drinking too much. I was an oil broker in London. You know, this is where all of this came from. And now, through my own healing, I want to help other people. And why yeah. Yeah. your your work fascinated me so much, and and why now I get to help share with the people because well, it's kind of like the selfish selfless pursuit um yeah so trying great. to help myself yeah. first to help others yeah that's Tamala? great that's great yeah yeah absolutely yes so can we um i mean uh can we finish on the acronym so that uh okay yeah so let's, uh, let's finish on the okay yeah okay so you want to go through the acronym okay yeah, the acronym well, first of all yeah. explain it and and then let's yeah go. okay so the, the acronym is dopamine and it's just kind of a summary of the basic framework that we use uh in the clinic to help people coming in with all kinds of problems, not just compulsive overuse or addiction, but also anxiety. Oh, hold on, I'm going to sneeze. Bless you. Excuse me. Uh, that's going to be followed by two more, guaranteed, but hopefully not until the end. All right. Later. <laughs> later. Hopefully later. Um, I'm like a three sneeze kind of a gal for some reason. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So, so, so this acronym, so, so D stands for data and that's where we just focus on facts and ask people to figure out what their drug of choice is, that thing that they use in a way that's contrary to their goals and values, compulsively out of control, difficulty cutting back and just give us the data, how much, how often, and what are you using? And that has two important functions. First of all, it um, allows us to know what the patients are using, but it also allows the patient to know because when we put into words what we're doing and we tell another human being or we write it down on a piece of paper, it becomes real to us in a way that it's not usually visible because we're kind of like squinting our eyes and not really seeing it until we tell another person. So that's a really f uh, important first step. And I say to people, if you have more than one drug of choice, like most of us do, you can you know do all of them. But uh, generally what we do is we focus on the most problematic one or the one that the person themselves wants to change. The O stands for objectives this is where we ask them to tell us, you know, what, what does it do for you? Like we wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't do it if it didn't do something. Um, people usually use either to have fun or to solve a problem. That problem can be very wide ranging, including self-medicating, for example, depression, anxiety, insomnia. So we ask people to talk about, like, like, what are you getting out of it? What's the good side? Then the P of dopamine stands for problems. That's where we ask people to reflect on, okay, what's not working for you uh, with this drug? Maybe it's a problem at work, a problem at school, a problem with your primary relationships, or maybe it's just the problem of neuroadaptation where the drug isn't doing what it used to do, 
or maybe even doing the opposite because that's what can happen. Like, you know, cannabis used to relieve my anxiety and now it gives me panic attacks. Like this friend turned on me, you know, so people will sometimes be prompted to come in for that reason. Um, and it's important that we do the problems after the objectives because we want people to kind of end on the problems. And then the A of the dopamine acronym stands for abstinence. I've also added asceticism in there. Asceticism is intentionally seeking out painful practices as a way to become a more resilient organism. And so this is where we ask people to engage in this four weeks of abstinence in order to reset reward pathways. On average, it takes about four weeks for those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop off and for homeostasis to be restored. Um, We warn people that they're going to feel worse before they feel better. Um, especially if they're using their drug to relieve anxiety or depression or to sleep, they're going to be more depressed, more anxious, less able to sleep. But if they can just not use for 10 to 14 days, their brain will adapt. Homeostasis will begin to be restored. Dopamine firing will start to upregulate and um, they will eventually start to feel better. About 80% of folks who can abstain uh, will feel markedly better and out of that vortex of craving if they can make it to four weeks. Patients often ask, well, if my ultimate goal is to drink less and not to abstain, can't I just cut back? Now, what I say to them is, number one, cutting back from high heavy use is harder, actually, than just quitting. Totally. Um, and number two, if you cut back but you don't quit, you will never fully reset reward pathways. You'll always be in a little bit of a dopamine deficit state. So you'll always be in a state of partial craving. Whereas if you stop completely, you reset reward pathways you're coming to the project of moderation or controlled drinking or controlled consumption from a real place of strength where you've got nice, healthy dopamine levels and you've got other things that you enjoy. Because what happens in our addiction is that we stop enjoying anything else and we're only focused on using our our drug of choice. Um, The I of dopamine stands for insight. And one of my favorite things in doing this exercise is how people will come back four weeks after abstaining. They'll be like, wow. I can't believe how much better I feel. I thought that my drug was fixing this problem, but I realize now that it was actually making that problem worse. So this is this kind of moment of great insight. The other thing that's always amazing is, well, people will look back at the amount of time, energy, money, creativity they were investing in their drug, and they'll be like, I don't recognize that. Like, who was that? You know, that's not me, and that's, that's not consistent with my values. So it really shows us that we get caught in it, you know, and we lose perspective. And that, so getting that distance from that black hole that's sucking us in can, can be a real revelatory moment. The M um, stands for mindfulness. Mindfulness is the ability to observe our thoughts and feelings without judgment. Um, and this is a great opportunity to practice mindfulness because when we can't reach for our drug of choice to alleviate, you know, our uh, in the moment distress or boredom or whatever it is, we really have to learn to sit. Uh, with those uncomfortable feelings. And in sitting with those uncomfortable feelings, realize, hey, you know, these these feel in the moment like they're never going to end, these feelings, but actually they do end. You know, maybe it's seconds, maybe it's minutes, maybe it's hours, but eventually I will come out of this place. And then, of course, we do recommend, again, hormesis or doing things that are painful or difficult or hard as a way to get those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop on the pleasure side of the balance to more quickly upregulate uh, the, the dopamine levels. So um, that mindfulness is, is a great opportunity to sort of observe ourselves. Um, dopamine, so... Uh, and next one. Oh, yeah, I did them out of order. I did, them, I did mindfulness before okay. insight. I was okay. like, you were dyslexic. No, I, yeah, I am dyslexic now, officially. Anyway, the N... We're on the, I, can't, I can't... Yeah, right. The N then stands for next steps. And this is after a month of abstinence, folks come back. We do this kind of how, what was good about not using, what was bad about not using... Generally, almost universally, the things that are good are people are less depressed, less anxious, better able to sleep, more motivated, more able to be present in the moment, getting more done, all the things people want in life. The things that people say are bad about abstaining was mainly the number one on the top of that list is couldn't hang out with the people I usually hang out with because the people I usually hang out with, you know, use this drug heavily. So that that is a you know that's a reality. It's like and those are my really good friends and I really like them. And I don't want to cut them out of my life. Yeah, you know, we don't want we don't want you to necessarily cut them out either. So then it's thinking about okay, well, do you want to continue to abstain since you feel so much better? Or do you want to go back to using? Most people want to go back to using, but they want to use differently. They want to use less. And then it's all a matter of developing that plan, right? That plan that we talked about. Okay, if you're gonna whether you're gonna not use or you're gonna use less, what what is that going to look like? 
how much, how often, what days of the week, who are you going to use with, what are your red flags, the circumstances you should be. You know, interesting because many of our patients with alcohol will have as their goal for next steps that basically they're not going to drink. They're not going to drink, but every once in a while they may drink depending upon the circumstance, but that will be no more than two to three standard drinks on that occasion. And then sometimes, you know, we give medicines to help with that. So this kind of extreme moderation uh, is is often people's choice. But again, we may, we meet patients where they are. And then the E stands for experiment. This is where people go out and give it a try. Some people are successful. Some people, as soon as they start drinking again, they have the abstinence violation syndrome and they binge and it's like clearly not going to work for them. Um, other people, they start out being able to moderate, but within a month or two months or six months, they're right back where they were. And then it's like, okay, maybe I need to either revise my plan or uh, choose abstinence instead. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you. And sounds super aligned to some of that, especially what you said, you know, most people after taking that period of absence want to go back to yeah. um, using something, but they need help and they need a framework and they, you talked about accountability and things like that. And I think that's absolutely key. Right. Um, and I, we want to help more people, then we need to help them where they're at exactly as, right. as you've said. Um, so amazing, amazing work that you're doing and thank you. Um, you're welcome. You too. And, um, Yes. So my question to you is about looking forward um, and mm -hmm. not just for you, but society. How do you feel? Where, where is this going? What's what's going to save us or change us? Yeah. What's your view looking forward? Yeah, I think that the problem of compulsive overconsumption is going to be the problem of modernity. And it's not going to be the problem of a, a small minority. It's going to be all of our problem. And it really needs to be front and center because this is the plenty paradox, right? We've now reached a point in terms of our technology and science and machines doing work for us and income and food source that like, we have a lot more leisure time uh, than ever before in the history of humanity. By 2025, we're projected to have something like seven to eight uh, hours of leisure per day as machines do more and more work for us. So we're really, you know, the, the idea was, oh, great, we're all going to be, you know, reading Aristotle. Turns out we're all playing video games with all of this leisure time that we have drinking and smoking pot and playing video games. So I think this is going to be a huge societal issue and we need to have the conversation and figure out how are we going to adapt to a world of overwhelming overabundance? Because if we don't adapt, we are going to kill ourselves. If you look at global deaths, 70% of global deaths are due to diseases caused by modifiable risk factors. And the top three are poor diet, inactivity, and smoking. So we are literally already consuming ourselves to death. We're also destroying our planet in the process of compulsive overconsumption from buying stuff on Amazon, you know, to eating rich, fatty, salty, sugary foods. So Managing our consumption is something that we owe to ourselves and to our children, but also to planet Earth. Otherwise, we are going to, you know, take her down in the process. So I see this as a really huge societal problem that affects everybody. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So let's move this front and center. Um, and um, thank you for helping bring this conversation to the table. Um, we've touched on the book an amazing book, Dopamine. You need to read it yourself. So please go and grab the book, Dopamine Nation, um, by Dr. Anna Lemke. A fantastic book, wonderful read, and lots of insights in there. How else do people um, find out more from you? That That's it. That's it. You know, the book is available on Audible for, for non-readers or people who prefer to listen or don't have time to, you know, commuters, whatever. Um, yeah, and that's about it. Your podcast. That's the others. Yes. Yeah. Listen to that, exactly. Yeah. Um, thank you. Well, hopefully, this is the beginning of a fruitful um, relationship together. Yeah. We'll see you.